Hi everyone and welcome to episode two of What A Flanker. My name is James Haskell. Yes, unbelievably we got to episode two and I'm joined by a very special guest today. Uh, every guest is special, but this man in particular, I've observed him from afar. He is, I've been very jealous of his just general sexiness, his full functioning body, um, his best-selling author status. Um, and we've never actually met, so this is kind of our first meeting, but that's, it's very 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, the legend that is Rosh Edgley. How are you? Jamie, what an introduction, mate. But no, likewise. So I've I've been following, not following, that sounds weird, following you for a while, but, you know, digitally, not in the sense that I'm hiding in the bushes or anything. <laughs> but um, no, mate, it's I'll amazing. I'll take that from you. <laughs> because I've followed, and I've got, I've probably, I'm going to apologise now because I've got so many questions that I want to ask you. Having followed your rugby career, seeing that transition into MMA, I know that's obviously got delayed with COVID. So, um Mate, I'm looking forward to this, basically. This is going to be good. Oh, I feel like we're having like a budding bromance before we've even started. We are like <laughs> the merging. I, just about my first question, because what I want to do with, with, with what a flanker was, is I've got, obviously, your book, um, The Art of Resilience, is, is out and is killing it. Uh, I've got a copy. I've got to confess that my wife bought me a, uh, a book for my birthday, and I've been working through that. And being a rugby player, it's got a lot of pictures to colour in. It's taken me a lot of time. So once that's, once that's done, I'm going to come on to it. Mainly because I am so excited having retired, wanting to, you know, because I really admire the different challenges. And I think actually having retired for the first time in my life, it's, I haven't been training for a purpose. So with the MMA stuff, I found another purpose. But actually, I, I've kind of been a bit lost because, you know, I've always wanted to have a goal. And the reason I really admire you is that you've always seemed to be adopting another another challenge. And, you know, is that really important for your, like, sanity to keep doing these different things that are so varied and, and different? Do you know, I, do, I'm glad you asked that, actually, just because um, I was recently uh, training with Eddie Hall, um, for those who don't know, World's Strongest Man. And, you know, obviously he's going into boxing now, super heavyweight boxing. They're basically creating a new division where you have to weigh above, I can't remember what it was, something obscene, you know, to even compete. And it's just nuts when you look at Eddie and, you know, he did his half-ton deadlift, one world's strongest man, and then now he wants to go and get punched in the face. And, and some people don't quite understand, and that's why I've been so excited to chat to you, because I think sometimes, and I've been trying to make sense of it in my head, I've always needed some physical channel challenge to just, like, just manifest itself, something to to train for, reverse engineer, deconstruct, something to target. Um, and in my research, one thing that keeps on coming up is the work of Aristotle. So Aristotle talks about this idea of eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, um, he believed, was just a better word for pursuing happiness. Because being happy and happiness, it kind of fell short. You know, it was just kind of like, it doesn't really fulfill what you're trying to get to. So he created this idea of eudaimonia, which is, is basically that you have to suffer and labor for something you know a sense of achievement he believed that happiness without fulfillment is failure so taking that that's what i think it's, it's the best example that i can think of why i want to when i climbed the rope the height of everest you know 8848 meters you know my hands were just blistered like you know i'd left half of my skin on the rope but my girlfriend who was watching me was like but he's happy you know, and then the same around Great Britain. A lot of people are going, oh, you know, how's, how's Ross doing to my family going? Is he OK? I saw, you know, his tongue falling apart, his neck. And my family were like, he's happy. He's so happy. And, and I think having sort of followed your career now, I thought it was so interesting from retirement in rugby to then going MMA straight away. I think a lot of people wouldn't get that. But what I've always wanted to ask you is is that you pursuing a different athletic adventure for eudaimonia? Do you, do you want to sort of struggle and suffer for that achievement, that success? Is, is it eudaimonia for you? Like, did, did that, are you sort of looking at Aristotle going, yeah, it makes sense? No, yeah, look, I think you know, Aristotle's got it right on a number of fronts, like most of those, those philosophers have, you know. I think... Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't know whether you'll agree or disagree with this, but I don't think the average person in the street knows what suffering is. I'm not talking about, you know, illness or suffering, but I'm putting your body into such a state uh, and being addicted to actually having that, uh, going through some hardship, going through some pain, you know, you know and we'll come on to you, you doing stuff individually, but actually the, the biggest bond you'll ever make with, with people is not 
you know, going out of the pierce or, or, you know, having a hug. It's actually suffering with them. It's a unified suffering of, of trying to achieve a goal and doing something together. And I, I you know, now I'm a civilian. Uh, I, I've bought my own, you know, gym membership for the first time in my life. And, and I go into the gym and, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Nobody's got a fucking clue how to train. I mean, some of the techniques... Uh, as people have invented exercises for muscle groups that don't that aren't there the techniques are like guaranteed like i'm talking guaranteed hernias uh you know there is there is lads you know lifting weights with zero resistance their muscles aren't any strain there are people on treadmills you know or, or with no incline there are people on, on bikes with no resistance and they're sitting there and they're on their phones they're doing stuff and i know there's like steady state cardio and various different things and as my wife always reminds me you know, and maybe, maybe your girlfriend's probably different is probably because she's seen you go through all this stuff. You don't have to be thrown up in the bin to, to have a good fitness session and get results and burn calories. But, but uh, there is nothing better for me than setting myself a challenge and going and putting myself in an absolute hole because you, the endorphins alone after that, but the sense of achievement of doing something that, you know, if something in life is worth doing, it's worth suffering and working hard for. And I think it separates those who are prepared to achieve those who aren't. You know, we live in a generation now of people turning around saying that, you know, oh, I've seen so-and-so on social media. I want this car. I've seen so I want that. I want this. I want that. Well, do you know what's going to happen? Do you know what's going to take for you to do that? You've got to do this, 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 this. Fuck that. That's, that's too much work. I'm not going to do it. And I, and I think for me, you know, my challenge to go into MMA was because I've always been a big guy, right? Um, people perceive because you're a big bloke that you can handle yourself and you're tough. And because I played rugby, oh, it must be tough. Well, you know, being punched in the face and kicked in the head and strangled is very different than taking to the field against South Africa. I mean, you know, there's a few South African players that, you know, have, you know, back his both to being one that wouldn't mind dropping an elbow on you or, or whatever else. But that doesn't, that doesn't prepare you. So I wanted to go and put myself into a hole. And the guys at London Shoot Fighters, um, you know, were, were notorious for the, the way they trained in terms of how hard they went, how physical they went. And, that, you know, they put me through my very first ever Versa climber session. I'd never heard of this disgusting piece of equipment called the Versa Climber. I'd seen a cross trainer. I was like, cross trainer is more my speed, you know, a spin bike. Okay, I've been there. But a Versa Climber, they got on me. And what they do is obviously, you know, MMA was, you know, it's five minute rounds, three five minute rounds. And they were like, right, we want you to do one, you know, one five minute round flat out. And it's amazing how the brain works. So I had no preconceived ideas as to what it was going to be like. I got on it and I was like, <laughs> I've seen Dolph Lundgren do this in Rocky Four. Like, you know, this this should be sweet. And I did it and, and you know, doing the five minutes. And do you know what? They'd said that there was a, I didn't tell them what the record was before they went in there. And I, I, I went in and I got over a thousand, I got 1,095 meters in five, in five minutes, right? I got off it and my, and I was like, you know, like when you're in that state of, of, of you've got the, that blood taste in the back of your throat, you're like so exhausted. If you lie down, it's uncomfortable. If you get up, it's uncomfortable. You can't walk. And, I got off the and the legs, and because they're just horrible bastards down there, they were like, don't give us some fucking Elvis legs, Haskell. And I honestly, I went to get to walk downstairs, and I was like this. I, it took me like seven attempts, and I was like, I, I, could, I couldn't do it. It was more disgusting to walk down the stairs than it was to do it. And it turned out the record of the gym was 1,195 uh, metres at that time. So I, first time round, had, had got there. Since that day... You know, I've got a Versa climb in the garage. I use it. Man, I can get over 900. I can't I can't break a 1,000. I just can't do it. Anymore. And it's it's amazing how, because I didn't know what suffering I'd have to go to to get there. Now I know. It, it, it's like there's a there's a block. Like, you can do it, but you it, it's just bizarre. So that psychological thing for me is important. But I, I, have to, I have to find a challenge. But because my body is now letting me down, I look at someone like you and I go, I'd love to, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to endeavor to do that. But half the shit you do, I couldn't even do. If this one, like, if this sort of, uh, if you and I want to walk somewhere, let's walk around the world. I can, I'll do that with you. But, but, you know, swimming, we'll, we'll come on to that. <laughs> swimming is not my forte. <laughs> no, but what I love what you just said there as well is just like that idea. And I said this at the start of the whole GB swim, like be naive enough to start and stubborn enough to finish. And it was exactly the same with you that when you got on the verse climb, you're like, all right, yeah, let's go. Let's see, let's see what this is all about. And you just ended up like overachieving. Again, this is going to sound weird, but within the book, we talk about the work of like Tim Noakes, central governor theory. He believes that, you know, when you're absolutely done, when you are like completely just like, I've got nothing else, 
In reality, you've got more. That's the physiological handbrake. So that's your brain basically pulling the physiological handbrake because it's saying, whoa, 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 you know, James, this is now too dangerous. Your heart rate's too high. Your, your body temperature's too hot. There's a lack of oxygen in the body. And, and so what happens is you pull that, that handbrake. Well, we've all experienced it. If you, if you run a marathon at 18 miles, you're like, I can't go on. Like, there's no way I can go on. Like, I'm done. I'm dead. My lungs are on fire. My legs are burning. But then what's happened, you'll see your family and friends and they're all clapping. And, you know, with two miles left, you goose step and you're sprinting. It's like, well, hang on. What happened? So I love what you said there, because in the head, and it's now called the psychobiological model of fatigue, because they're trying to acknowledge like the brain and the body. It's like fatigue is a combination of both. Whereas before, there were some weird experiments way back where they uh, cut off the severed legs of um, frogs and then electrically stimulated them. Stimulating, so they were kicking, 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 and they wanted to see at what point they would stop kicking because they thought that fatigue was just physiological, so it's just in the body. It also got weird where they started actually um, injecting cyclists with um, painkillers, so they were basically like paralyzed, couldn't feel pain, but they could still function. And what was really weird is they thought when you remove that pain barrier, they would go to just complete exhaustion. They'll just be going. But it wasn't too much of a difference. I think when you look at like, you know, Chris Froome or rowing as well, like you start looking at like Redgrave Pinson. I think it was Gold Rush, that documentary where they're just throwing up and just dribbling. You know, it's like, yeah, you're taking it pretty close. And what I love is that's what you did the first time on a Versa Climber. But I've been in the same situation where I'm like, how do I get back into that state? You know, and if you could, if you could tap back into that, it would be so powerful. And that's what I was essentially doing on the GB swim. And, and what I, I continue to do now, that I'm just a bit like, wouldn't it be amazing if you could tap into that? I've had weird, and I'm going off on a tangent here, but and I don't know how, I don't know if you've ever had these sessions, but I, I rarely drink, but if it's a friend's birthday or something, I will. And then the day after, I could be hung over, like just absolutely hanging, but your body will use alcohol as an energy substrate. So sometimes I've had some of my best runs, you know, because I had the kebab and pizza, I've been carb loading before I got home. So it's weird how I think when you look at sports science and you'll get this obviously performing at such an elite level, you have physicians, doctors, nutritionists, but then inexplicably you can have a session where you're like, that makes no sense. Like, I don't, I don't know what, like your Versa climber. I love that. It's interesting you say about the, you know, the alcohol situation. So I, I'll ask you, do you think, do you think a lot of what you do is driven by like demons in your head in terms of like, yes, you're in, you're in the pursuit of happiness, Aristotle's, uh, you know, you know, th that point of, if you get fulfillment and happiness through, through struggling, but do you, do you have demons in your head? Do you know what? This is weird. I, I had exact same conversation with Eddie just the other day, just because um, he's been very open about his mental uh, health struggles and stuff. I think, um, I talk about it sort of quite honestly in the book with, um, with, with my dad. So when I was halfway around Great Britain, uh, I was fine. Physically, I was fine. Nutrition I had on point, swimming technique. I was like, I'm going to finish this, no problem. Um, and I got a phone call um, where he, he basically uh, has um, stage four uh, cancer. It, it, uh, it was terminal. Uh, it, is, it is terminal. And he, he said, um, you know, look, you know, you don't come back on that. I just wanted to go back on land. I was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I just want to go and give him a hug. I want to be there with mum. And he, he was like, but you, you know, you can't do anything. Um, so you might as well just finish this, finish what you started. And he made me promise to, that I could come home and give him a hug, but I had to do it via Margate. So if you'd have asked me this like two years ago when I started the GB swim, I think what was weird is I, I come from a family, uh, like my dad's a tennis coach, mum's a, a, was a sprinter. One of my granddad was in the military. The other one was a marathon runner. I, I grew up just with a love of sport. So I had, I think what was weird is I had no demons. Um, and, but, but more than that, I think, uh, and I'm a big fan of Emil Zatopek. For those who don't know, he, uh, uh, three gold medals, Helsinki Olympics, uh, ran the 5,000, 10,000, and then I believe it's the marathon. Never ran a marathon before in his life, but ended up just like saying, I just want another gold medal, ran it and won it. But what people don't know about Zatopek is he just, he loved running. Like for him and his missus, um, date night, because she was an amazing javelin thrower. She would go out and launch a javelin and he would go and pick it up like a dog, bring it back and be like, there you go, babe. And she'd just be pinging it. So that was date night. And I just think if you're on the start line against a guy like Emil Zatopek, 
Who do you think is going to win? A guy who needs discipline, determination. He's got to drag himself out of bed every Sunday and go, I've got to train. I hate this, but I'm going to do it. And don't get me wrong, it's still powerful. Muhammad Ali talks about, I hated every minute. He used boxing as a platform. You know, so there's, you know, one of the greatest. And he admitted he didn't like it. But when you've got an Emil Zatopek, someone who just loves it, that's, that's a hard person to be. And I think for me, before the GD swim and before the news of my dad, I was in this camp in that when people said, is Ross okay? You know, my girlfriend just be like, he just, he just likes being out there with jellyfish, like teabagging his face and just watching sunsets and sunrises. He loves it. But since, um, since, since uh, like the news of my dad, it's, it's, things have perhaps like changed a little bit. But, but I openly acknowledge oh, I've just come from like such a supportive family. So everything that I achieved didn't come from demons. It was more the fact that I was like, I want to swim around Great Britain, mum. And then my mum and dad were like, yeah, you do. Good luck. And I was like, thanks for your support. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, like some, you're like some big Labrador, like the big family dog Labrador. They're like, oh, God, is he all right? Yeah, he's done a shit in the garden, but go and fetch the ball. And he's like running around like, yeah. Oh, God, he's, he's gone swimming again. God, he's so pleased. He's covered in mud. Look how pleased he is. Oh, look, he's brought a rabbit back to the door. Uh, you know. Oh, look, he's carrying that giant log on his shoulder. I mean, essentially, you're a Labrador. <laughs> I've just realised, a golden retriever. No, but the reason, the reason I asked about demons, though, was, was, was not necessarily about, you know, mental health thing. In terms of, like, a lot of what I did in my career and in my life is, is the, voice in, the voices in the head, but not the voice in the head, like, kill everyone or anything like that. The, the voice in the head are, you know, I go and have a few drinks, and then the next day I'd wake up, and I'd be like, you know, I feel I feel a bit of guilt about doing that. You know, I, I want to be professional. I want to achieve. So, do you know what? Other people will be resting. I'm going to go and train. You know, I'm going to go on holiday. And my my coach has set me a load of sessions. But some people aren't going to do that. But if I sat there going, well, I probably won't train today. My body's a bit sore. I will purposely then go. No, actually, I'm going to go and do it because of some sense of it was a fear of failure. A lot of the time when I was playing, it was a fear that. If I didn't put the work in, I would somehow lose my fitness or I'd be diminished. And it was stupid, you know. It, it was like uneducated on certain aspects, you know, going, oh, if I have if I have a couple of drinks, I'm suddenly going to diminish my fitness. I'm not going to feel as good when I'm running around, you know, in a, in a week's time or whatever. Or that, you know, it might, might sort of hinder me, to, you know, but I'm not talking about drinking every day because obviously that would do. But I, I had a lot of demons. I talk about it in my book about stuff that, you know, I probably had a chip on my shoulder about not people not perceiving me as good enough at what I did. But I'm very much like, you know, if I said to you guys, well, you know, we were going to do a training session today, but it's a little bit rainy and stuff. And, you know, a lot of people would say, do you know what? You've trained really hard the last four days and you did some good PBs. Let's have it off. So many people give in to that. And my demons in my head would be like, no, you know, and I, I, I always try to have this mentality. If I'm doing like a, so a what bike session, because at the moment, because I've got, I've got a problem with my back, I've got arthritis, my ankle, my, my body's sort of falling apart, but I still, at least twice a week, I have to put myself through some form of hit or some form of horrificness that that you know I, I I will feel good about you know whether it's you know circuit battle ropes versa climber you know burpee something something to 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 do that and and there'll be there'll be times where I get through and your muscles are exhausted and your head's going and I and I I always think you know I know Lance Armstrong was geared out of his brain and they always say that you know that that I mean if if you you know if you're on that much gear you, you know I mean people say that. It was that a funny expression? People say that fair play to Lance Armstrong. Last time I did loads of drugs, I couldn't even find my bike, let alone let alone ride it. But I think that's obviously a dip of different kind of set of drugs. But it, it's you know it's the, it's the fact that you know quitting, you know while you get some comfort because you get, for example, on your swim, you know not taking farther out of it for a second. But you know if you'd given up, you know you could have been warm, you could have been normal, you could have been hydrated, you could have rusted your muscles. Uh, my mentality is, is don't stop. If you have to slow down, slow down, but never, never, never stop. You know, if you have to like on the bike, if I, if I can't maintain, but I, I don't want to get off that bike, I won't get off it, put a bit of resistance down, get going and then get and keep going. That's how I, I sort of deal with it. But I, I certainly have demons mm. that, that, you know, that, that got me through my career where I trained when other people weren't training. I was, you know, almost to the point of overtraining. You know, I was, my training week was, uh, you know, I would do re wrestling twice a week. I would see Margot Wells, a speed coach, twice a week. I would do my weights. I'd do all my normal rugby training. I used to go and train with a guy called Phil Learning in the morning to help rehab my injuries. And one of my friends once turned around and said to me, 
you know, you, you're overtraining, you're just doing too much. But I was like, well, I can't leave any space for, 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 you know, for complacency. I want to get better. And he goes, yeah, but you win no awards for, in my world, for training. You will win awards for performing. And I was turning up to stuff tired. And, and it's, it's been balancing out those demons. So I wondered whether it's you like the battle of that voice in your head and actually where some people would give in. You, you obviously just don't give in. I do, do you know what? I love what you just said there about like, you know, you don't win awards for training. You know, you win awards for performance. I love that just because one thing that I found on the swim was I, I did use sort of, you know, like, yeah, demons, negative advice. I remember when I started um, and it was on YouTube and everyone said, oh, this guy's going to go and swim around Great Britain. The amount of comments, just people like, oh, I, you know, he's built like a hobbit. He's too, you know, people taking bets going, I reckon he'll do a mile before he bonks. Like it just, I got slated. And I think people, you know, some people like, you know, certain endurance athletes perhaps as well were almost um, annoyed that I'd even attempt it. I think, you know, in certain circles, people were really quite passionate about in their sort of uh, hate for me. You know, there was quite a bit, but I used that at the start, but I quickly realized, and, and you'll get this, that, you know, if you are gritting your teeth, if you are, you know, you're angry, if you, you can't do that all the time, it's, it's good and it's powerful. It'll get you through a tide. But I was swimming 12 hours a day, you know, for 157 days. So if you're just like, oh, you know, getting angry, like, oh, screw them, I'll show them. You can't do that for 157 days because cortisol levels, stress hormone, your immune system, like adrenal fatigue, central nervous system, we're like, what are you doing? So I tried to use it like sparingly, but then equally, I, I talk about, you know, like swimming with a smile, you know, but that, that was the only way I could describe it because sometimes I was just like, Ross, you, you can't swim on just anger. But I'll be honest. Yeah, there was some times where I was like, do you know what? I might dip into the comment section. And it was, I love that. Certainly actually coming around the top and coming down the other side, because a lot of people were like, oh, wow, you know, he's, he's possibly got this now. And some people were going back to the first episode on YouTube and some people were going, um, he'll never do this. Oh, he's going to sink. He'll, he'll die trying. This is a stupid idea. And people were going back going, well, this uh, this comment didn't age very well, did it? You know, and I was there like going like, yeah, you know, like I was a bit like, good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Coming back down the, the south coast. So, but I use it sparingly because I don't think you can swim like, you know, sour and just kind of like, oh, I told you so. We, you have to, you have to balance it out. I found, yeah. And so that's why, I, I suppose my question to you is, with your demons, but also, I love what you just said about um, camaraderie with your teammates, especially important in rugby. What percent would you say? Like, was it, you know, because it can't be like psh, demons, like 80%. You know, I bet because there was a lot of camaraderie where you were like, I'm going to war because my mate needs me. You know, so do you think it was? Yeah, look, I, I think it, it, look, it's always, it's, it's difficult sometimes to quantify you know, exactly where you were, you know, you, where you were mentally. I mean, I, I'm going to, I was going to ask you this as well, was that I've always used a sports psychologist. So I suffered from a lot of self-confidence issues, which is bizarre considering I'm a huge gobshite who's absolutely happy to take his clothes off. will do most, most media things. I, you know, I, I stand up and talk in front of thousands of people. My last DJ gig was me headline for 5,000 people. Didn't give a shit. But if someone questioned my ability as a rugby player, someone questioned, uh you know how I was you know or I would watch myself back or I'd make mistakes I was really hard on myself or you know it's too hard to, to the fact it was it was holding me back and I went and saw a sports psychologist early on by a lady called Jill Owen who was amazing and she's you know we talk I talk about her and what a flanker because actually in rugby and bizarrely in a lot of sports and why I was going to ask you this this question you can answer in a minute was so many people and if I said to you Ross you're going to run fast if you buy these trainers or if you drink this supplement, you know, you're going to be flying, right? But if I said to you, do you know what, you can improve by about 30% if you went and talked to a psychologist. Most people will go and buy the trainers, eat the supplements, but they won't do it because they perceive having to talk to a therapist as lying on a chaise long, crying, you know, saying, you know, something happened to me as a child or vice versa. I went and saw, I went and saw Jill um, and it was all about trying to deliver performance because, when I played out in France at Stade Francais, right, there was no, there was no infrastructure in general, but there was that, there was also no psychological elements, no nutrition, no nothing. So back in the day, when you played eight games a season, for example, like you on your swim, you could play eight games a season on hatred. You could swim 
you know, however, you could swim a few hours on hatred fueled by comments. You know, I'd, I'd be rowing next to the boat shouting, and this bloke said you're a fucking hobbit, and he said you can't swim, right? Like, you know, <laughs> whatever it might be, you'd be like, oh, you could do that. The length of time that you took to swim your your thing, which how long, how long was it? 157 days, one, yeah, right, 157, 1,792 miles. You couldn't do, you know, that amount of time with on on hatred. So there's obviously something more to it. And then and then you know what the psychologist taught me was I was I used uh, coaches disrespecting me. I used self doubt to fuel. So I would call that demons. I used a fear of not achieving my career because. You know, my book is all about kind of doing everything for a story, essentially, like a short, you know, it's not just I got autobiography, I woke up when I was, you know, was five and wanted to play rugby and I love my mom and, you know, we drove here. It's, you know, it's, I did list loads of stupid shit, so I've got a funny story to tell. So if I was to die now on this podcast, you, I can tell I've done whatever I could do. And it was the same in my rugby career. If I was going to have a long career, or short career, it was all about doing the most I could possibly do out of it. So at any point, if I stopped, I'd give, I'd left no stone unturned in the pursuit of it. So with the psychological thing, I had the demons, but then I had to work on process. So process for you, as you said, you know, you said uh, your, your swimming technique was spot on. You know, if all else is going to shit and you're struggling, if you had the mental fortitude to bring it back to your process, what your coach had told you, what you knew, get the mechanics right before you know you're into it. And also things like, you know, using music as a tool pre pre performance to emotionally change my state. You know, so if you had an argument with your missus, you know, you got problems at home, you're tired, you, you know, you woke up in a shit hotel that's two thousand degrees, you'd be sleeping on a small fish finger bed, and you know you've got to play a massive game. As soon as I put my tunes on, I made a few bullet points about my thing. I was in, so I had that kind of structure which always helped me go through with it. And then with the self doubt stuff. If I had thoughts of demons and my the, the, the tipping point was too much, I would then um, I would then read it back and go, do you know what? Reflect on some good moments of stuff that I have done. If I had some negative thoughts, I would visualize. I spent my whole career visualizing, changing negatives into positive, and that for me was was really important. But what I was going to ask you was, did you use a psychologist for this stuff? Did you ever address that? You know, to, to work out how you would get through these things? No, I, I think I am. Um... I, well, well, actually, I think uh, it was slightly different because obviously, you know, you have been, uh, I was going to say groomed, that sounds so weird, but you've gone through the system, you know, so that, that, in that, <laughs> they, that they were like, you know, this is, this is James Haskell, you know, let's get him everything he needs, nutritionist, you know, a sports psychologist, everything. Um, he, for want of a better term, he's like a prize cow. He's, you know, one of England's best players. With me, you've got to remember on the GB swim, no one thought it was possible. So I had like, I had no one, no one was supporting me. I had, um, you know, I, 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 I sort of alluded to it a little bit, but, you know, a few sponsors um, uh, even dropped me on the South Coast because they were like, oh, you know, he's not going to make it. <laughs> so, you know, it was... <laughs> Shut up, really? Yeah. yeah, it was like when I started out, I mean, and it's funny, I had friends actually in Australia um, one of my friends, Scott, uh, who was the editor at uh, Men's Health Australia, was like, I thought it was a bit of a weird joke. I didn't get your English sense of humour. And I went, what did you mean? And he said, because you announced it, but there was no press there. And if you look at the start of, of the, the whole GB swim, I mean, you know, like Julie, she was the mayor of Margate. She was lovely. She came to say a few words. There was like four people from the arcade who came over to see what was going on. <laughs> like, there was barely anyone. So... Not only did I have to start it under resourced, underfunded, and underprepared, but I think when I was going through it, I've got to give a shout. Like Matt Knight, the captain, was he, he, like just incredible. He's been sailing like, over forty years. People have since said, like you know, and like what he did was just incredible. Never got a single tide wrong. But the amount of times me and him would just sit there and my tongue's falling off, like my neck is in pieces, and we would just exchange stories. And that's why I love what you just said there because. I remember there was times like my neck was just getting infected, you know, so I was like, and I was putting like wounds on, we had to like gaffer tape it up with duct tape to try and make it waterproof. And uh, I was just in pieces, like my head was like down and, so, and then Matt turned to me and he just went, Ross, this is like the pyramids. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, it's like the pyramids. <laughs> he goes, the pyramids in Egypt were built and you would spend your whole life, generations after generations were building those pyramids and dying you know, and they never saw the finished product. And I was like, right. And he goes, and although you're in a hole, if you finish this, you will see the end of your pyramid. You know, so I'd just be like, 
thanks, buddy. <laughs> and that would get me through another swim. You know, so we were just exchanging stories. And I love what you said, because I was, I, the whole swim I talk about in my book was inspired by Captain Webb, 1875, first guy to cross the English Channel. No one believed in him. Everyone said it was impossible. Water too cold, tides too strong, cannot be done. But Captain Webb on a diet of beef broth and brandy just smashes it, breaststroke, all the way across while his brother, and I think it was his cousin, was just like throwing him sandwiches and brandy off the boat. And he just crushed it. I think it was 26 hours, something like that. Uh, the current record's like six. So that gives you an idea of how long he was out there. Just, and he didn't do front crawl because at the time, uh, front crawl was ungentlemanly like. So he just like, bang, gets it. So like, when you think about demons, I can only imagine Captain, you and Captain Webb would have like got on. <laughs> but, and there was an element for me, I think, that I was just like, yeah, do you know what? When I finish, it will be nice, you know, that people will, will probably not take, take me more seriously, but it'll be nice that, you know, this swim will, will hopefully, you know, go down as a really cool star, story when so few people believed in it. So to answer your original question on psychologists, it's like, no, I had friends who I just bounced ideas off and went, does this make sense? And they went, yeah, yeah. And I'll go, cool. I read in Aristotle and Marcus <laughs> Aurelius, you know, and, and I then also just, when you add up, so I was swimming for 157 days, swimming for 12 hours a day. So it works out. I spent over two months staring at the bottom of a seabed. Can't hear anything, can't see anything, can't talk to anyone. So like that was two months of really reflecting quite a lot. And I think what's weird is also if you do have demons, sometimes they can just manifest themselves. You could go into a swim and if you go like, oh, you know, so and so was a so and so was a dickhead, or you come out and you are livid, you hate that person because it's just been remunerated in your head. So that was interesting as well. Yeah, that like you can't you can't go in and swim through the night, through the moray fur, left alone with your own thoughts if they're bad. Like you had to learn to control it, you know, and only use it if you needed those demons. Yeah, it got weird. Your mind goes to some weird places. <laughs> but do you know what? Because honestly, all the stuff with like the the psych. So for my, my for my career, I never. I always had to to seek outside stuff. So you know, you said about like the team. You know, I it was a psychologist. I had to go and find that. I had to go and like nutrition. I had to go and find it. It was weird. We didn't have that. They didn't provide that kind of stuff for us. And, and basically, one thing that I think the reason I had some level of success with what I did was because I went and actively pursued stuff. So for example, you know, if I if I wanted to go and embark on some challenges, you know, I'd come and I'd come and speak to you. I'd, I'd email you and say, "Listen, can I speak to Ross? I'd like to ask. I'd like to pick your brains." You know, nutritionist, I would go and see Matt Lovell or Phil Lerner, you know, and, and that's what set where some lads would just would take what was on offer, the, the club physio, the club, the club sports scientist. I was like, well, there's no psychologist. I'm going to go and find one. I'll pay for that out of my own time. I, the nutrition, I don't think nutrition is good enough. I'm going to pay for that out of my own time. And I think that made made like a real, a real difference. Do you think, um, do you think with your with your swim challenge, you came out of it psychologically a, a, a different person? with that self-reflection. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. It was weird. I, I think I like aged, like well, physically, I mean, you know, I just looked haggard. I come out, I look like a chubby Santa Claus, just coming out like a sea Santa Claus, but, but mentally as well, it just, um, I just, yeah, I just, I think with everything now, and also this, this gets a little bit weird as well, because I love what you said as well at the start, which was, uh, you know, you just want to, you just want to be the, some weird old man and people will be like, who's that over there? They'll be like, oh, it's James Haskell. And you'll just be like 80 with all these stories, like telling kids, like going, oh yeah, let me tell you about my rugby career and when I smashed this dude at MMA. And I love that. And for me, I was the same in that I was like, I just, I, you know, I'm going to be 80 and I just want to turn to my grandchildren. This is gonna, or, or just, or, this is going to sound weird. I just wanted to go to anywhere now in the UK. I can sit there just on a cliff in my speedos and just go, I've swum around there. You know, and everyone's like, all right, you weirdo. You know, and I just want to be like a chubby, fat old man in my speedos telling people I swum around there. So I did it for, for story, for, for, um, for intrinsic reasons, where the process is its own reward. You know, not, not medals and everything like that. I just wanted to do it so I could go to any, anywhere around Great Britain. And I said, I've swum around there. But I think that's slightly changed now because I, I acknowledge that I, I say it was like my Captain Webb moment. So I did it for me. And I did it so I could say I've done it. But since a lot of people are saying, what's next? What do you want to do? What's the next big adventure? Go swim here, go swim there. And I've gone like, yeah, but it, but it has to be for a, for a higher purpose. Like it can't just be so I, you know, come out and go, I did it again. That's another world record. Because 
it just doesn't interest me. And I think everyone will be like, all right, Ross, it's getting a bit boring now. <laughs> like, I don't want to do it for that. But if if there's another, a higher purpose, a reason, you know, for being, this is going to sound a bit weird, but the Japanese have a term called your ikigai. And I love this. It's it's basically just your your reason for being, you know, your reason to get up in the morning. And they say it's made of four things. So what you love, what you can be paid for, what the world needs. And uh, finally, um, uh, oh, sorry, what what you love doing, what you can be paid for, what you're good at. And uh, there's a final one, which uh, escapes me right now, uh, what the world needs and what you can be paid for. I think I've got all four of them there. But basically, um, for me, now if I'm looking for another swim, it probably has to be a bit of an icker guy, like in, in that it's got to be something the world needs. With the GB swim, kind of was, you know, a lot of people have said it's since got them into swimming and everything. Uh, retrospectively, because I wrote a book on it, I suppose I've been paid for it. It's what I'm good at and it's what I enjoy. So we've hit those four points. Um, so, to, but, but when I started the GB swim, I didn't, I didn't really think like that. And I think it's probably the same now, even with you looking at MMA, it's just like with Bellator, hopefully, you know, they're paying you well, you know, are you good at it? Yeah. According to your Versa climber. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> <laughs> do you enjoy it? Hopefully you do what the world needs. Hopefully everyone's turning around and going, wow, yeah, after you're finished rugby or any sport, that's not the end. So you'll go on to inspire others. Do you know what I mean? So for me, I love that because it could be an icker guy. The Japanese will be looking at you and going like, yeah, fair one, James Haskell. Did you, did those sponsors call you back up after you did it? <laughs> no, <laughs> mate, it was brutal, honestly. So the South Coast was the worst. I remember I was like uh, two weeks in and um, that was when my tongue was falling apart. Ended up in the in the galley. Yeah, what do you mean by the tongue falling? Talk, talk to me about the tongue falling apart. I don't. I don't yeah. Know. What do you so, mean? so basically, like the the human body's not meant to be in salt water for that long. So I was swimming twelve hours on every single day, and it, it basically takes all the moisture away from your tongue. So it, it basically starts to like erode. Like first the first layer, so you could just do that, and it would you could scrape a thin layer off off your tongue. But because I was in there so long, I was just pulling chunks off. Like you could see the taste buds, and I was there. Um, I've told this story. I'm going to apologise for people listening, but I, um, I was in the galley with Matt, the captain, just chowing down on some soup. It was a vegetable soup. It was really nice. I just wondered why mine had meat in it. So I turned to Matt, the captain. I was like, mate, is it, how come I've got chicken or pork? What, what, how come I've got meat? You haven't. And he just leant over and was like, mate, that's, that's not chicken or pork. It's your tongue. <laughs> so <laughs> it was at this point also as well. Oh my God. <laughs> my neck as well was getting infected just because of um, the salt water and the wetsuit was just grinding into my neck. And then you can get like a sea ulcer. So a sea ulcer, if you were cut, but then you're getting in the water like 12 hours a day, every single day, it's just never healing. So it gets deeper and deeper. So that was actually getting like, I've still got kind of like scars like now where they, it was just getting like, I mean, they can get to the bone and they can get septic. It gets, so that was where I was at on the South Coast. And, and, and absolutely, I think if you're looking at that, I, I mean, I don't necessarily blame some of them, but, but the sponsors, they're probably just thinking like, no way, like, is he going to make it? This is terrible. And do we want to be affiliated with this if something goes wrong? So yeah, I had, I had some, uh, <laughs> some emails and it was just like really polite, <laughs> but just chopping me. <laughs> Did you write back to them after you'd gone and just gone, <laughs> unlucky mugs, you just missed out? I didn't. I didn't. I mean, thankfully as well, I've, I've you know, had some amazing sponsors who stuck with me as well because I messaged them, you know, and I was like, guys, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, this is going to take a little bit longer, you know, than I was planning. And they just went, no worries. As long as you're out there, you know, we'll still be supporting you. So there were some amazing ones. But yeah, honestly, for the South Coast, we talk about those demons. Yeah, I used that for a little bit. Because I was like, you know, I don't want to... Yeah, it would be nice. But I didn't even have to say anything at the end because it was, it was amazing with everybody swimming in and, and the whole spectacle that we created. That I, You know, I think they probably looked and was like, oh, you know, made a mistake. But I don't blame them because from a business sense... And this is probably the same, though. Like, in rugby, you kind of like... It's, kind of, it's a sport, but it's kind of a business. So if you're injured and they sort of go, oh, we're chopping you, you're like, oh, that makes business sense, but you're not going to look after me. You know, and sometimes you will get a great club who looks after you. So it's weird. I sort of saw the commercial, cold-hearted commercial aspect. And I was like, I, I know I'm probably not a good horse to back right now. <laughs> but then on the other side, I was like, you know, it would be nice if someone looked out for me. But also, to, to your point, that did actually bring me closer together as well as a team. 
because I think as a team, you know, me and, and, and Captain Matt were just a little bit like, right, you know, cool. Brings us together. So, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've actually been, I've been chopped more times in a farmer's field from sponsors. So I'm slightly more controversial than you at the best of times. So it's not a problem. I got, I got dropped actually. I, I tell the full story of my book, but I, I did a photo shoot with my wife um, for Fabulous Magazine for a Valentine's thing. It was a bit raunchy. And I, I love my wife to death, but she's like, she's got two settings, like all, all, all or nothing. She can't like, she's just got no filter. And they basically said, oh, what about your sex life? It was like a Valentine's dish. And she went, oh, we have sex a lot, blah, blah, blah. Headline, we have sex every day. Uh, I'm going to name and shame them because I don't give a shit. Uh, Land Rover, after 12 years of like me going above and beyond for them, they just sent me an email with a picture of the newspaper going, we don't want, um, we don't want people uh, to, you know, we, our, our customers don't want to see this kind of thing. Um, you, know, you, you know, this is not what we're about from our ambassadors, right? And I wrote back saying, well, I, I mean, first of all, that's quote is my wife's quote. Secondly, it was a, a Valentine's photo shoot. Thirdly, uh, you know, you implying that you're, the drivers of Range Rovers and Land Rovers don't have sex, and uh, and that you know because I said that's a bit odd because you know we can all pretend we can all pretend everything, but you, if you pretend that right, because I said if they don't have sex, you 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 sort of run out of people to buy your cars. Let's be honest, right? And then and they wrote and they went yes, but we just don't want, we just yes let you know but that's not the point. We don't want to see it. I went well. People who drive Land Rovers and Range Rovers don't buy the Sun, so you know you've you've you've, you've double proved yourself wrong. But um, they still, funny enough, Ross, they still bin me off. But then I actually did some work with Rolls Royce. So what I used to do is drive past the um, the Land Rover factory in in, in a Ghost with our fingers out the window, going, "Cheers, lads! Cheers, that." So, um, but that's it. That story, anyway. That's another story for another day. But I, you know, I've been chopped by those sponsors. Do you know what your your uh, Captain Matt? You say Matt was his name. That wasn't was it? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, do you know who you two remind me of? Is are we? I got to do some work with the um, SBS and some special forces guys in the SBS in, in two thousand and seven, preparing for the World Cup, and it was a real kind of eye opening experience because I think, you know, like yourself in, in terms of resilience, those guys. I'm actually going to talk to, to, to Jay Morton as well. He's going to come oh, on wow. on the on the um, on what a flank of the podcast, and we talk about different stuff. And, and I think for him, it's for me. I want to talk to him about working in teams and that teamwork stuff. But I sat down with some of these guys, and there was a guy that had, uh, who had recently come back off of injured, off of being injured. He'd lost two of his friends in Afghanistan on a, on a mission that went wrong. And you know, we're sitting around talking, and I asked him the same question. I said, "Listen, I'm open about my mental health. I'm open about men not being very good at talking about it, but I also am open about the fact it can really help performance." So I said to him, "Do you guys talk to psychologists?" Expecting the fact they dust however many people they do on a, on a night mission, that there possibly may be some few, a few demons needing discussing. Um, and they said exactly what you did. They don't go and speak to a psychologist. They don't get a therapist. They sit around with a beer, say around a campfire in the evening or, or when they get back and they just chew the fat and they just chat stuff and they get stuff off their, off their chest in that way. And that resilience and that camaraderie comes from having a tight-knit team. So for me, it's very interesting that actually I think Again, you know, the demons of people criticising is one thing. Your sponsors is, is, you know, cutting is one thing. But then, as you said, it pushes you closer and makes you tighter because then you're in a you're in a tighter battle. Actually, while the captain's not going through it physically, he's there to pick your pieces up and then reading off your emotional stuff. And that that's as powerful as talking as the psychology. It's as cathartic mm. as sitting there because you're addressing stuff and you're talking stuff and you're getting shit off your chest, but you've got a mission to do. And even if you are eating tongue soup, <laughs> fucking sounds horrible. Um, but I imagine, I imagine trying to burn, what are you saying? It says here as well that you were uh, powering through 12,000 calories. Is it 12, six? No, how many calories? It says yeah. Like, yeah 15,000 calories a day. Yeah. I'm not sure tongue soup was on the agenda, but I can imagine that was quite funny. <laughs> it's exactly that. Yeah. It was just, that it, you were basically just in survival mode. So, I mean, um, shout out to Stonehaven actually out there uh, where the battered Mars bar was invented. My God, I did six in a single tide. Um, felt amazing, like just deep fried chocolate. Oh yeah, I, well, I came it was like coursing through my veins. I was like, I feel amazing. And then after an hour, I was just dribbling with my blood sugar level just all over. <laughs> but it, it was that, that, and this is where it became so weird because um, it was, uh, it didn't become a swim anymore. It, it, it just became about controlling the breakdown of the body. And I, I mean, I go out the, uh, the Talisker Whiskey um, Atlantic Road, 3,000 miles across the Atlantic. I find it fascinating. I go every year 
And I almost perform like a bit of a, a sports science autopsy because I love like chatting to all the individual teams. I think there's about 52 teams last year. Um, and everyone from like ex-military, like rugby players, like and what's really weird is you look at all of the tangibles. So you see these like uh, like collegiate rowers, their technique is absolutely perfect. It's, you know, it's crisp. They're all like six for eight. Um, I think it was two years ago now. No one was looking. They, they were called the Dutch Atlantic Four. Uh, two of them were over 60. One of them was shorter than me. You know, I'm already, I'm like five nine. He was shorter than me. And then the, the other one um, was, was sort of pretty lean, pretty skinny. No one looked at them. They smashed it just because of the, the intangibles. They were all fishermen. So they all could read the weather. They'd know if something was going wrong with the navigation on the boat. And they said, it's not about stamina. It's about uh, rituals and routines. And like clockwork, they just work. And also as well, they talk about when they were rowing. I was like, how did you spe- celebrate Christmas? Because they set off December the 10th and then they come back like end of Jan. And they said they were just rowing and they just went, as it got to midnight, they went, it's Christmas. And they all went, ah, oh, Merry Christmas. You too. That was it. <laughs> That's how they celebrate. So they didn't even stop for Christmas. That was it. But um, one thing that, again, I love about that is, is so often um, some of the teams that do the best, uh, use, and, and, you know, you, you'll probably appreciate this more than anyone, that uh, it was, I think it was four uh, rugby guys, just absolutely massive, big, strong, could just rip the oars, you know, out of the boat. And I remember speaking to them and I was like, guys, you know, it's fascinating that, you know, you won. You know, a lot of people are crediting your power output, your strength. And they just all looked at me and they were like, can we be honest? And I was like, yeah, you know, please do. And they were like, basically, we all got together and went, what's the record? And it was something like, you know, 28 days or something. And they were like, okay. And they just turned to each other and just went, but we've been out on the lash and partied for longer than 28 days. We can go that without sleep. And then, <laughs> and they all went, yeah. And they, so that was their intangible that they just they knew they could suffer that much and just abuse their bodies for twenty eight days. And they went, they crushed it, they won, you know. And everybody, the articles read, you know, like you know, four rugby guys so big and strong and raised loads for charity, which is amazing. But I also love the unofficial story, which was just like we've abused our bodies more than that. So rowing across the Atlantic is no big deal. I guarantee as well that the, the chat, the chat as well, you know, the, the, oh. the camaraderie between each other, just chat and shit and stories because, you know, there's no point as well. And because, you know, we obviously talked, I want to talk about the, the resilience with you, but, you know, but there's obviously something about, you, you, as you said, you enjoy it. If you, are, if you ask your missus and your, your tongue's falling off and your back's infected, is he having a time of life? You'd be like, yeah, he's like a pig in shit. He's absolutely happy. So you obviously have a certain amount of enjoyment of, of what you do in that pursuit of, of perfection and perfect happiness. But also, you know, you're, you're a gregarious guy. You're, you're a good bloke. But you could have some of the fittest blokes in the world, sports science, you know, to, to the T, genetically perfect, nutrition perfect. But when the pressure's on, if you don't have... The, the, the right balance of a team of someone to pick you to pick each other up like I you know a lot of my role was I, I you know my team stuff is I was always very um professional but I was a bit of a dichotomy because I was you know the, the the first one in the last one out you know as I said pursued all these other things out of my own pocket out of my own time you know was did all my extras every single day every you know to, to the point where they weren't extras they were they were being out cheesy being normals that's all I that's all I did you know, spending that extra time. But also I had the balance when I wasn't on the field to bring humour and to bring levity and to bring that, that 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 kind of balance. And it was weird because some coaches I had with with England team were like, James Haskell doesn't fit into that mould. You know, he doesn't fit, you know, he's not vanilla. He's not this person. So, you know, how can he, he trains hard, but he's also got, he's fucking gobby. Like, you know, he takes the piss. How do we keep him? But then the bizarre thing was is that when morale dipped or something happened, they then wheel me out to be the performing monkey to do that. And the reason Eddie Jones uh, you know, got the best out of me is that he he wanted me to be me the whole time. And he understood that I was extremely hardworking, self-reliant, but also I had a I had a personality. And I guarantee that in those boats and on those swim, half the battle was, you know, you might have found a a person that was probably fitter than you, maybe, if that's possible, someone better. But because you had the ability, because you to make relationships, because you were able to be uh, determined, because you saw you had the right balance, that made a difference. I guarantee those guys in that boat, the chat at some point, they would have gone, why the 
fuck are we doing? Like, what is the point of doing this? This is not as fun as getting on the lash for 28 days. But then you would have had the bounce back and the guarantee that someone in the team would have been really chatty. Someone in the team would have been more sensible. And it's really interesting how the, the balance of those teams can be, can be you know, amazing, especially like the old boys as well. The intangibles that so many people have that sports science, you can measure it, you can test it, you can, you know, you can blood test it, you can analyze it. But sometimes why one day you're better than another day is 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 a mystery that we'll we'll, we'll never know. I think that's yeah. so intriguing. Oh, mate, really intriguing. You're so right. And it's even on that now. Like there was a study done, uh, Frontiers uh, Journal of Neuroscience, and they found they had cyclists cycle to complete exhaustion. And they were showing them these pictures, like um, basically to register on a, on a subconscious level. So subliminal cues, people either smiling or frowning. And what they found is emphatically those who showed pictures of people smiling performed better and had a greater resistance to fatigue. And then equally, there was a, a, another study that was done with running as well. And they just found by smiling, their running economy, their VO2, everything improved because it just relaxed everything else rather than gritting your teeth and running, you know, like that. And I think with um, Kipchoge, sub two hour marathon, I found it fascinating when, when he was out in Vienna and he was there towards the end you could see he was almost like smiling a little bit, but the commentator was saying he does this. That's when he's hurting. But it was him just saying, no, 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 everything's fine. And you know, with a sub two hour marathon, everything running biomechanics has just got to be poetic. So it was just this whole like mind body connection, a slight smile on his face to go, no, 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 it's okay. So I love what you said, but you're right. And I've actually experienced that. Um, I suppose like throughout my career, so certainly in, in water polo as well, that it was just like, if you didn't fit a mold, you weren't perceived as being professional, but you were like, no, me joking around is just kind of helping. It's what I've got to do. And uh, I mean, I loved um, The Last Dance, Michael Jordan documentary on Netflix. And I found it fascinating with uh, Dennis Rodman when Dennis Rodman was just like, you know, uh, Phil Jackson, the coach, and he just turned to him and was like, look, he said, I just need to go to Vegas for 24 hours. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> when? And then Michael Jordan openly said when he came back, he was smoking us all on sprints, like interval sprints. You know, he just works like that. He just, and he was allowed to work like that. I think he's amazing. So were you, were you, so you were allowed to work like that under Eddie. Is it sort of something similar now that you're doing when you're like moving into MMA or any other athletic adventure? Are you, are you now? I'm, do you know what the weird thing is? I'm exactly the same. So, so, so the MMA stuff, you know, I, I hammered that for six months, six, say six days a week. You know, four, I was in a car for four hours a day going, you know, to, to the training. I was sparring in a cage three days a week, full on sparring. And then every day of the six days, I would then I would then be either uh, doing wrestling or, or, you know, five, five minute rounds of wrestling, jujitsu, as well as technique and everything else. So I became a full professional sportsman again. Um, and then basically lockdown happened. And and since then, obviously, uh, training wise, my body sort of fallen apart. So I'm seeing what's going to happen with that because they talk about fighting in empty arenas. And with all due respect, I. I wanted to fight because I wanted to test and do, you know, to, to find out about myself. But I'm not sure I want, I'm going to want to commit to fighting in empty arena. You know what I mean? It's, and, and also injury wise, like genuinely, I had an MRI scan on my back on Friday. I've got three bulging discs. I need shoulder surgery. And I'm thinking to myself, do you know what? I've been in pain for since the age of 21 every day, like every day in pain. And it's, and it's, again, it's something, you know, what I've talked about and what a flanker, you know, you normalizing pain, being comfortable, being in pain. And, and it's, it's like I genuinely envy because I'm sure you've got um, injuries and bits and pieces and stuff that bother you and all these kind of mad things you've done will have no doubt profoundly affected, you know, you in, in, in certain ways. But I'm, I'm at a point now where, you know, I want to enjoy my training. I need a goal. You know, I need to start training with someone because if I'm not goal orientated, I don't struggle to train but I want to do something, you know, I have to find a challenge. So I keep ringing the lads up and go, what's the, what's the Ruhr machine record on that? Or like, what session I do? You know, because I, I have to do something so I can go, I've achieved something because I think, you know, and Aristotle, you know, I think you're, what, what does he call the word again? I really like uh, it. Eudaimonia. Yeah. Eudaimonia. Eudaimonia. Mm -hmm. So, right. So, so you, so eudaimonia for me is like, it, you know, that, that, that suffering, but also the fact that you achieve something, I think training without a goal, is, is is pointless you know even if you go i want to look bigger that's fine get to be if you want to look leaner get leaner if i want to be faster get faster people go wrong because they try and do it all in one go but i need to do some stuff that, that, that's related so but my application the same thing i put into rugby is the same thing i put into dj is the same thing i put into writing a book is the same thing i put into public speaking and everything else it's that same you know 
going to find people that do it better than you, you know, working on it. It's the same of, of breaking things down, analyzing it, looking for feedback from the right people, the extra commitment, being organized around. And I, I've done that to, to all the stuff that I've kind of, uh, I've done, which I find, you know, has been, you know, invaluable. But certainly now my, my life goal at the moment is to, is to get to a point where I'm, you know, I'm pain, well, reasonably pain free and I can start functioning again to a point because you know, I'm 35 and, you know, I was going to get a dog. But, you know, I wouldn't be able to take the dog for a walk because because my, after about 10 minutes, my ankle would have fallen apart or my back would have seized up. So it's a bit of a weird situation I'm in with these with these things. But um, and what I was going to say, we focused a lot on, obviously, the, the swim because it was such a profound thing. And I think it makes it even more interesting, the fact that it had never been done and that you're a pioneer. And I imagine, you know, when so many things in history, when people suggest stuff, everyone went... <laughs> All right, you mad bastard. You never, you know, it's like you know, the first person you know, when they said the Wright brothers like invented the plane. They were like, "Yeah, all right, chief. Yeah, we'll see you by the tape." With you know, and then you've gone and done that. I just, you know, I know it's going to be a cliche question. You would have been asked it uh, all the time, but well, actually, you haven't been asked this. How the fuck do you go to the toilet <laughs> with difficulty? Like, so it depends which uh, what you need to do. If you just needed a piss, usually I'd just be like, "I'm just going to go in my wetsuit," which. Uh, which wasn't ideal because then I'd have to hang the wetsuit up in my cabin, which was tiny, and my girlfriend would be come in, you know, visit. It was like the world's worst air freshener, <laughs> just hanging up in in thing. But if anything else, oh. you'd you'd try to hold hold it for the the six, you know, twelve hours. But sometimes it was hard as well because like um, uh, Penland Firth, you're doing like like nine knots up there. To put that into perspective, uh, a dolphin cruises at like ten, eleven. Michael Phelps swims at five, you know, so you're going faster, you know, than even, I mean, I know you, you joke about your own swimming prowess. If me and you were ever in Scotland, I will take you to the Penland Firth. You will be faster than Michael Phelps. <laughs> so you could just like, if you just keep up. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> but so yeah, you, I was just a bit, if you, basically you don't want to get out and go to the toilet then. You want to stay in and make use of that tide. And that was the thing about the swim, Fine. you know, that it just became, you know, trying to use the tides. It, it was it was it was called the Great British Swim, but it was more a sailing, you know, uh, masterclass from Matt. You know, more than anything. So yeah, that's 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 how. To... <laughs> if I get fit enough, right? If I get fit enough, will you take me? I mean, not necessarily on a full mad bastard, you know, Ross Edgley thing. But can we do something together? I'd like to do something. Just a, you know, film it. I'm sponsored by GoPro. We'll do something. I know you'll work with Red Bull if you still work at Red Bull. Um, you know, we, you know, we could do something funny just for for pure. Lol's sake, just to see what 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 it'd be like. Because I I told you off off air before. I, t I told you off air before. My my, I I will have a go at anything. So if you said to me like bar so running, I don't think like running for me is just not going to happen anymore. Like you know, I, a lot of ex players either get fat as fuck, but I'm way too vain for that, or they go mad and they do like Iron Man stuff and or ultra marathons and they look like they may be dying. Like I I saw one mate. And I, I genuinely start, start, I set up a just giving page for him, and he was like, "No, no, 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 no! I'm this is what I'm supposed to look like." I was like, "Oh, oh, are you? Okay, fine." So I don't want that, but I think something there might be something that we could, you know, that I'd quite like to to explore. But my my swimming thing was on holiday. My, you know, we train every day, so we would do a variety of different training to, to you know, and I we would used to run when I could run, we'd do stuff when I was playing. But then we I saw an island out in Ibiza. And, it, you know, there's a gap between the two things in the channel. I mean, bear all the boats going across it. But I thought, do you know what? We'll swim from there to there. And Chloe went, oh, that'll probably be, you know, like a 15-minute swim there. We'll go and have a look at the island, walk on it, and we'll swim back. <laughs> so my wife's unbelievable at, uh, you know, breaststroke and, and swimming. So she, we get in the water. And, you know, I won't drown. I won't give up. But I, So I was swimming, right? So Chloe's breaststroke, right? So I didn't have any goggles on. So you couldn't front crawl. Right. So I thought I was doing breaststroke. So my wife just fucked off like a mile ahead, like went w well ahead of me to the point where the waves, I lost her in the waves. I couldn't see her at some point. Boats were coming. Right. And you're like, you're obviously like, I told her before that, you know, people die all the time getting hit by like motorboats and speedboats and stuff swimming around. She's like, no, that doesn't happen. I was like, it genuinely does. It's a bit difficult to try and Google it when you're in the middle of the sea. So I then, I then swimming, but. I got to the side, so it took me 40 minutes to get from this one thing to this other island, right? She was already on the island. We got there. It was really sharp and rocky and covered in bird shit. So you couldn't, I didn't bring any little booties, you know, like waterproof booties. So I couldn't even stand on the on the land. So we got there, had a little kiss, took a little GoPro photo, 
Then I went and swam back. She went even faster on the way back, right? And I had my Apple Watch on at the time. Mate, it took me 80 minutes. I burnt 4,000 calories. And it turned out that my swimming was, you know, like with breaststroke, you're obviously, well, you, you're, you're an expert swimmer, but you know you're supposed to be completely flat. I was basically swimming with my legs below me and just pulling myself <laughs> through the water. Because, she, yeah, like that. Literally, literally going through the water like that. And she was like, babe, you, you, you're not using your legs. I was like, I am using your legs. She went, no, they're underneath you. And obviously, because I've got a real stiff lower back or whatever, and I sink like a stone. I, in the pool, she would try to educate me. She'd stand there holding me like a child going, keep your hips up, keep your hips up. I was like, oh, my God. So I'm actually not too bad. Like, I used to, do you want something? The fittest I've ever been was with a guy I used to work with at uh, Wasco called Terry Evans, Big Tell. And when I was injured, hypoxic swimming. Mm. Like, I love that and I so we would do like you know swim a length underwater pop back up swim front crawl go back down swim out as far as you can pop up all those different kind of sessions mate that was unbelievable then I was you know I, I might have not given you a run for your money but I might not have drowned after five minutes but you know I, yeah <laughs> mate, honestly I would love that honestly because I like this was what was so cool about um sink or swim which we did with channel four when you know I, I got to coach like Linford Christie you know hero of mine uh, you know, great. I was supposed to do that. Oh, I'd have loved it if you'd have done it. Why didn't you do it? <laughs> they asked me because because I did. I was supposed to do. Um, it was during it was it was where the Bellator stuff happened. So oh. I'd just done. I'm a celebrity, and they contacted me to do it and spoke to it. And I thought about it because I, I was like the perfect candidate. I was like average to gas swimmer, <laughs> but you know, sports mentality. I would have done it. Um, but I couldn't make it work in the end. But then I didn't know, I, you know, I obviously knew of your time. I didn't know you were coaching. It was only when I saw the advert that I realised it was oh, you. Do you know what? Honestly, I would 100% love to do that. Like, we'll do a whole sink or swim version on our own. There's a cool lake up near me. Um, open invite, spare goggles, always. But genuinely, I would love that because I think, like, so often with swimming, like, people are like, oh, I'm not very fit at swimming. It's like, it's not even about fitness. It's hydrodynamics. You know, it's just understanding how to, and I love how you just said you were moving through like the water. So like that would be made, but, but even as well, what would be so cool is actually just looking around, like you could do some cool stuff. Because I mean, yeah, what I love about how ambitious you were as well, if there was an island there and off your mainland, the way that the tide would rush between there, but people, people don't understand. So the very, did you check the tide table? You're in? No, did you just, did you just, <laughs> what's a tide table? <laughs> <laughs> mate right we need to swim we need we need to swim and this is the thing what i love is 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 coaching people of all shapes and sizes like we did on sink or swim i think you would be amazing um because you would just take to it but also as well it it just gets very different when you start adding tides currents waves jellyfish uh you know the seals off lundy island you know we could i would honestly i'd love to do that open invites come and join me at, like any time mate it'd be so right. cool i'm gonna mate I'm now a retired sportsman. As long as I get my body sorted, I've got, I think I've got a few injections in the spine and I will be, I will be back. I, I tell you what I did actually learn the other day, because I'm like, I, you know, when it comes to like, I love canisthenics and everything else like that, like I taught myself to be able to do like muscles up, muscle ups and stuff like that. It was quite fun and everything else like that. Uh, I, I don't think it's a great idea now. I've discovered that I've got a slap lesion in my shoulder, but I was, I used to be able to do them. So all, there's all loads of stuff that I learned. So I only learned to rope climb the other day. And then I saw that you did this like mental rope climb. How did you, how, how did that work? Because I, ha I haven't seen about that, but I only learned to rope climb the other day. I, did you have, you didn't stay on the rope, did you? You have to keep coming off or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so it worked out, it was a, a, I think it was a 20 meter rope and we basically just did that repeatedly until I'd climbed the height of Everest. But we, the worst thing was, is we didn't count the, the down bit. So you'll know that eccentric contraction in the bicep like that going down. Yeah. Oh, so people ask me like, what was the worst challenge I've ever done? And like, yeah, obviously... GB swim, no picnic, you know, just getting like wet willied by a jellyfish, not pleasant, tongue falling off. However, what was weird is like, if things went wrong, they would be like, oh, Ross, that looks like it's getting infected. Like, you know, we're calling it. So you could kind of do it safely. But with the rope climb, it was just that peak contract in the bicep. Just, I thought at some point I was like, that tendon is gonna snap like that. Like it's not happy. So that's, you know, and developing technique, you know, for that, it was, yeah, that, that became really interesting. But I mean, what are you weighing now? Well, <laughs> this is funny. I weighed 128 kgs yesterday. 
oh, but that's obscene. The very fact that you're doing muscle ups and rope climbing. And, and again, people don't understand that. So that's, I'm, I'm 94 right now. So that's handing me a 20, 30 kilo disc and then telling me to do it. No deal. No deal. So that's amazing. Uh, I, I'll, sw- I'll slim down. <laughs> I'll sli- I slim down. Like I, I, so basically, my wife's an amazing, um, you know, nutritionist and does everything else like that. And she, I basically fluctuate up and down. So when I, I lost 12 kgs when I did I Am a Celebrity in 18 days, came out. I was at 122 when I went in. I came out 110. Uh, basically, because of my, I'm not doing as much cardio. I'm just doing a little bit more weights or I'm doing hit stuff. And you know, I, I went up to 128 yesterday. But to be honest with you, I, I'm going to start tracking my food again, again. So I'll probably, I quite like sitting around 122. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, that's that's okay. You know, I'm still going to be BLT, big, lean, and tanned, and that's uh, <laughs> and that's that's all you need. One talking about bodies, but talking about bodies because I know we've been, we've been going a little bit longer, but you know, you're a fascinating bloke. And I, if we're going to do, if this what a flanker doesn't get taken off air after episode three, will you please come back because there's so much more to talk to you about? <laughs> well, a hundred percent. I just on the just very quickly, I love what you said there though as well about the body as well, just because I think. It was on the GB swim. I set off like 91 kilos. Uh, what was it? BLT, big, tanned, big, big lean and tanned. Big lean and tanned. I was, I was BLT. You're permanently tanned. You're permanently tanned as well. I don't know what you're up to, but you're permanently <laughs> tanned. So I was like, yeah, I was BLT when I set off. And I was like, yeah, yeah, like I look wicked. This is great. I'm so quick in the pool. By the time I got to Scotland, like lost my abs, was hairy, smelt of urine, you know, but I was just like, I was, I was also like, uh, with all the bad um, fried chocolate, um, people were like, you're going to lose weight, you're going to look like Tom Hanks from Castaway. I finished 105 kilos, which for, you know, 5'9", you know, I, I was just like that. And, and what I like, though, is that eudaimonia, coming back to that in Aristotle, that it was, you know, and I, and I posted just saying, you know, make your body an instrument, not an ornament. And I think that's part of the journey as well. And that's what I love about what you've done. It's kind of like, right, James Haskell, you need to be one of the best rugby players in the world. Okay, noted. Like that. Okay, right. Now, kind of, you know, form follows function. You know, so what are you doing now? It's like, okay, cool. I'm going to try MMA. Bang, you went into that. And so that's what's really fascinating, I think, because whatever you choose next, whether it's, um, you know, you start your your swimming career, your sea swimming career, (laughs) rope climbing, whatever it is, it'll be... (laughs) I love how you breaststroked it as well. You're like the Captain Webb of rugby. You just crushed it. Beef, beef broth and brandy, just like that. I just don't know if, I te- I don't know if my technique's any good. <laughs> so that's what's nice is whatever journey, whatever athletic career you go on next, it's going to be really cool to see, you know, whether you are BLT or morph into something different. But do you know what's interesting is that, so, so this is, Early on in my career, right, and and you know, I, I'd like to do a show on, on a, a longer show with you on, on, the, on almost this kind of stuff. But I, I was one of these people who used to buy a men's health magazine. I right? didn't know anything about nutrition, didn't understand mm-hmm. anything. You know, when you're when you're at public school, especially, everyone thinks creatine's a steroid. So you're like, oh, do you take creatine, bro? You're like people, like people are dealing again. Fucking else, do you see so and so? He's got massive. It's like that's nonsense. Okay, so. I didn't know anything. So I would read men's health and obviously look at the news. And every five minutes, there's a different bit of advice. Eat an avocado. Don't eat that. Red wine's great for you. Red wine gives you cancer. It's just all madness. Okay. So I tried to eat for a long period of time for aesthetics, thinking that I was, I mean, I, you know, a, a men's health cover model without the, the face. If, they, if I wore a bag on my head, we'll be okay. Right. So they, they, you know, I sort of had that mentality, and then, and then it dawned on me that I was a performance ad- athlete. My, my, my ability was to perform. So, genetically, I was actually always been in a reasonably good place. But I, I ate and trained for a performance base only, not to ever look like I had a six pack of abs. And so many young players and people's advice is like, lads, there is no point in having a six pack if you can't run further than this. There's no point being able to do this if you can't lift this or, or be able to perform. So I completely changed my mentality and what was interesting for me was I went rugby player performance my wife aesthetics right finish finish playing uh top uh, you know tops off last set sun's out no reason to do anything pure straight bodybuilding you know I discovered moderate state cardio I didn't even know that was a thing I thought it was sick in a bin or you're asleep right I, I found moderate state someone told me about steady state and I was like I am not fucking doing that I am not uh, you know, a single divorcee going to spend time mincing around doing that. I, that's, I don't know about that. Moderate, 
we could talk about that staying at about 140, 150 for, you know, I, I, heart rate, I could deal with that. But sick in the bins where I like to live. So then I did that. And then I got into fighting and discovered the hardest, toughest, most physical, demanding sport I've ever had. So much so that halfway through, I almost had a meltdown on a, on a number of levels, physically, psychologically. You know, you'll know about this. My creatine kinase level in my body was well into the thousands and was the same as if I played back to back test matches. Uh, and I, you know, and I had all the signs of overtraining, had everything, but I, you know, and I, I was, I was obviously leaner because I couldn't, I couldn't maintain body fat. I was eating 5,500 calories every day. I was tracking everything and I became a professional athlete. Then lockdown happened. And I was obviously then had to completely adjust my calories again, because I didn't want to get bigger. And because of this thing and through injury now, I'm now sitting where I'm in sort of intuitively eat, eating apart from my wife walked past me. And I also had a little bit, I must be a little bit bloated. She walked past me because she tracks everything, slapped my stomach and went, oh, got the old intuitive eating dab, have we? I was like, what do you mean the intuitive eating dab, you mean, bitch? And then she stands behind me and she goes, she goes, oh, she goes, James, I don't mean to alarm you. And I'm like, what's happened? What's happened? She goes, looks like someone's stolen your ass. And I was, she, and she got, just calls me, you know, like these people with flat back. I've got no bum. I've got no bum and a dab. So I, it's now time to... To re to reform my 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 you know my setup. But uh, what I want to know though quickly, just because I know I've spoke, spoken a lot, but a lot of people, right, when they get when they want to f- get in shape, right, the first thing they do, New Year's resolution is they go, I'm gonna start running, right? So people put their green flash plimpsoles on, they go running, and they they're in hell within five minutes, find it terribly boring, right? And what I always tell them is that nobody's ever looked at Mo Farah and gone, I want Mo Farah's ring. <laughs> right? I've never, I've never I no one's ever seen it, right? So and I've, I see swimmers, right? So I look at swimmers, I go, Michael Phelps, right? Big shoulders, lean. But I go, that's not really my, my vibe. Mm-hmm. I've seen your photo. I follow you on Instagram. I've followed you for a long time. Like, just as I'm ever thinking about eating like a pie or something like that or doing something, I look at your Instagram. And I literally, like, <laughs> by the power of Grayskull, I'm like, hold on a minute. How's he looking like that? And he's a swimmer. You're the only person... <laughs> That you look like you shouldn't be able. I mean, that's what they said in the comments section. You look like you shouldn't be able to run. You look like you shouldn't be able to to think. You look like you're like a men's health cover model. So what what are your secrets that, to being the absolute mayor of Rig City? Even though I've discovered that you're the same height as this grenade supplement box, which does help. Because in the photos, I thought you were six foot three, but you'd fit in one of my pockets. Which is, I would. No, I would. You know, do you know what? Like, there is that. There's definitely that. Like, because when people do meet me, they they are like, oh, you know, you're a lot short. I'm like, yeah, I'm not a tall guy. You know, and I think maybe, yeah, finishing the GB swim, holding a trident, beard. People thought, oh, yeah. And then they see me and they're like, oh, you know, underwhelmed. So there is, there's 100% that. And I acknowledge that. I think, like, but, but also, like, and I'm glad you brought it up, actually, because I think on social media, like, sometimes, yeah, you know, oh, I would post, you know, some of some of the pictures where I'm lo- looking a little bit better. That's why I liked actually the Men's Health Australia cover, and it was me 150 days into the swim. You know, I would like no six pack, just like scars all over me, like fat, hairy. You know, and I was like, yeah, yeah, like that. That was really cool, and it was almost like um, I don't want to say like liberating, but I was just like, that's the body I'm proud of because that's the body that swam around Great Britain, and I'm glad that they put that on the cover. And Scott Henderson, the editor, I'll, I'll be always forever grateful. And I posted it going, I'm so proud of this cover. Uh, recently, uh, 220 Triathlon as well posted one. Like my beard had turned ginger in the Scottish sun and salt water. And I'm just like, I look haggard. And, you know, and they put that on the cover. I was like, yeah, good. Because I do think, you know, we sometimes have a responsibility to, uh, to, to, to honestly tell the truth. There's, there'll be a lot of people... So we're just like, oh, you know, young, 100%. young boys, you know, rugby players going, oh my God, that's James Haskell, I follow him. You know, and it's so nice that when you talk about it like you do. So I just, I think that's so important. And also as well, I come from, I mean, you know, Loughborough University. I love the days. This was probably, and I was talking to, to James Smith about this, actually, you know, mutual friend of ours. But we were talking about how, I think like over 10 years ago now, it was, it was strange at Loughborough University because if someone was quite big, you know, and they were maybe like doing like supplementary bodybuilding centric work, like hitting some bicep curls, something like that. You know, you'd go over and be like, oh my God, like you're a big guy, uh, rugby. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, rugby. And you'll go, like, oh, wow. Ooh. You know, and you'll look over and then you'll see like the swimmers with this V taper and you'd see, you know, um, you know, good friends of my female rowers who had like these amazing backs, but their body was an ornament, you know, it was an instrument, not an ornament. But I think something happened over the last 10 years now where you can be in the gym 
and you'll go over to some guy who, you know, he's stacked, he looks big, and I'll go like, oh, hey, rugby. And they'll go, no, 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 uh, Ibiza. You know, and I'm like, oh, you're training for Ibiza. And they'll be like, yeah, you know, and there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just acknowledging the change. And I think what was interesting is, is 10 years ago, swimmers were proud of their big shoulders and thin waist and no legs. You know, people were proud of their like, you know, uh, you know, big legs, rugby players, because they couldn't fit into skinny jeans because their legs were an instrument, not an ornament. But something kind of happened along the way. And now people are like, oh, did you skip leg day? Oh, can't fit in skinny jeans. I'm like, what happened to celebrating those no, no. individual differences? So I'm glad you asked about that. Yeah. Have you achieved that state of happiness? Are you, are you or what, would you describe yourself as a fulfilled person? Oh, do you know what? That is a really good question. I, I think for me, I, I personally don't need to do another big swim for me. You know, so for like records and, and, and a sense of accomplishment and personal eudaimonia, like I, I don't need another swim because if I grow old now and I'm just and I'm forever known as the weird guy who swam around Great Britain, like that that's kind of it it for me, that's enough. However, I do think you you know you're constantly striving for something else. And I think if there's something for a higher purpose, not to bore you, but like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, that idea that there's a pyramid at the base, you've got food, warmth, and sleep. As you move up, you've got like social needs, like family, friends. You know, I've ticked all of that off. As you move up, you've got prestige and a feeling of accomplishment. You know, I'm kind of there. But then at the top, you've got self-actualization, which Maslow talks about. And that's kind of like, you know, doing something for a higher purpose, reasoning, sort of reaching your full potential. And I think in some ways, that's maybe what I'm looking for. But I'm also quite high up Maslow's hierarchy. So I'm also, coming back to what we're talking about, I'm also maybe looking for an ikigai, uh, but certainly not something that that i personally need because i think to go through life just going i've got another record you know i've got another trophy everyone will be like all right mate you know i'm, I'm almost like where you're at you've had a great rugby career but you're maybe going maybe, maybe there's something else but i'm also okay chilling but but, but i want something else but i'm also kind of okay i'm no, I, i'm satisfied because i discovered that you know, I, you know, I was money, money orientated for a lot for a long time about stuff. I wanted to achieve goals and achieve be the best version I could be. I wanted to create stories because I wanted to be. If you and I went for a beer, even now, you know, we'd never met before. You know, we have. I feel like we could have a rapport. We could sit down, have a beer, have a coffee, and go off on a tangent. I don't think it would be very awkward. And I think we have shared a, a shared life experiences, but also different experiences that would come together. And I always wanted to be that person who's got something to say and, and has done stuff interestingly. Am I satisfied? No, I'm not satisfied because I want to do more and I want to achieve more and I've got I've got other goals. But what do I find satisfaction in? A good bottle of wine, good food, you know, being around nice people. And I don't need, you know, a nice watch. I don't need, you know, a, a, a mega car to, to 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 justify that. And I think some people look in the wrong directions for that. I do think I need some challenges. I do think I need to find a train with with a purpose now and train with a goal. If the fighting stuff isn't able to to happen through through injury or through 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 COVID, um, so yeah, I'm on that I'm on that journey. But I think for a long time in my rugby career, I wasn't satisfied. My biggest regret was actually not celebrating those those moments. And I and I don't know well enough to know whether you do this or not. But to you know, you're an incre unbelievably impressive bloke. And I think I'm glad to hear that you aren't. You know, you've got the Ica guy as a good guy to, you know, to try to tickle. Is it good for the world? Is it good for me? Am I going to make money out of it? Because I think that so many people for, don't celebrate those moments. And, and I think all the, the, the three challenges, you know, the world's strongest marathon, which is insane. We haven't even talked about the world's longest rope climb and the Great British Swim. You know, they're three life changing moments. That if, if one person had done that, they would they would be satisfied for life. So I think you should be very proud of what Aww. you've uh, what you've done. Um Oh, oh, such a oh, nice guy. Oh. He's such a nice guy. Uh, 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 what is next for you, though? So your book is of your book, The Art of Resilience, is out. What is next for you, uh, and where can people find you if they want to to learn more from uh, from what I gather, an extremely well read person who's got more pyramids, Japanese philosophy, Greek mythology. Or you know, Aristotle was Greek. Wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. Ancient. Oh, yeah. the meathead knows what he's talking about. Watch out! Watch out! Quadruple threat. Funny, funny. Big rig. Podcaster. Well read. You're welcome. <laughs> right. I, do you know what? I I think I'm weirdly in a similar, uh, very similar situation to you. I'm I'm 34. You know, and uh, I've kind of had 
a really cool, very, very lucky career to date. You know, and it's only when you just listed them, then I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, that is actually pretty cool. I should celebrate a little bit more. But I suppose uh, looking now, uh, another sort of, a lot of people are saying like, let's, you know, what do you want to do? Where do you want to swim? And, I'm, and I've said to a lot of people, you know, I will do something, but let's raise money for charity. Let's do something for a higher purpose. Like, and I've, I've said the, the same brief to them. It's got to be Maslow's hierarchy. It's got to be Ikigai. It, it's just got to feel right. It's got to make sense. And I love that you did exactly the same with your MMA. You are like, this is what I want to do. But then you've just questioned and gone, is, is it going to fulfill me before I go any further? Oh, okay, COVID's happened. It'll be in an empty arena. Is that going to be my Ikigai? Is that going to be Maslow's hierarchy? Is that going to give me what I want? And uh, it, it's, I, I think that's essentially where I'm at. You know, Einstein, when he said, uh, adversity introduces you to you. I'm looking for that challenge exactly like you are, but it, but it has to be the right one. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, uh... I'll be joined by the legend that is Ross Edgley. Ross, do you want to tell people your social media and, and a bit about, you know, where, where they can find your book? Yeah, oh, thanks, James. Yeah, no, so, uh, yeah, Instagram, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, just uh, at Ross Edgley. Um, and the book, uh, I think Amazon's a good place, but Waterstones as well, so available from uh, most places. But, um, mate, thank you so much for this. I've really enjoyed it. Like I said, it's it's been a little bit weird. I've tried not to fanboy too much, but, I've mate, I've enjoyed this. And I'm just looking forward That's right. to our swim session now. Mate, I will do any. Listen, if it's swimming, rope climbing, something fun, as long as it doesn't revolve running, I'm I'm all over it. Um, but look, <laughs> Ross, you're a legend. I'm going to have you back, you know, whether you like it or not, and we will definitely catch up. And do, do you know what? I may I might even get a follow on Instagram from you after this show because don't think I didn't fucking notice. Don't think I haven't noticed. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about. It. We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But it's fine. It's fine. And. <laughs> and and, and ladies and gentlemen, my name is James Haskell. Uh, this, flank, this podcast was called What a Flanker. My book is out now in Waterstones in Amazon as a hardback. Hopefully you enjoy it. We touch on lots of points about resilience in the book. Ross, you're a legend. I'll catch you very soon. You're such a legend. Thank you very much.